afternoon. What an honor to follow Kevin Slavin's talk, one of my all-time favorite TED Talks. And so in honor of that uh, talk, why don't we do a little data collection here ourselves? So by a show of hands, how many of you looked up directions at some point in getting here today? Anybody? Okay, I see a lot of hands. Now, I want you to keep those hands up, keep them up, and keep those hands up if you used one of these, uh, an old road map. Oh, those hands went down really quickly. Yeah, because this is like ancient technology, right? This harkens back to a dark ages when planning your trips meant you didn't know which way to go, you didn't know what traffic was going to be like, and do not even get me started about folding those things back up. <laughs> it's horrible. But thankfully, we now live in a world where with the click of a button, we can see exactly how to get from A to B. We know the fastest route possible, and we can take into account traffic. We can take into account weather, so we can all travel more efficiently. So what changed? What got us from there to here? Data. Google Maps takes in huge amounts of traffic data, weather data, historical data that it analyzes and crunches to help get you from A to B in the most efficient way possible. And whether you're aware of it or not, our lives are increasingly being touched by these data-driven decisions. Data drives everything from how we figure out which movies we want to watch, to which products we want to buy, to who we want to be friends with. So we're in the middle of, or the beginning, I should say, of a data revolution, because more and more of the interactions that we have with each other and with our world take place with a computer or a cell phone in the middle. And all, that means all of those interactions create data, little pieces of information about what we do, what we don't do, what we like, what we don't like. And that can all be collected and analyzed so that we can live in a more efficient world and we can all make better decisions about how to live our lives. So if you think about the implications of that, that's really big. That's amazing. We're quantifying society, and we can become more efficient. And yet, as Jonathan Brunn pointed out earlier this morning, much of our efforts are focused around entertainment, making ourselves more comfortable. Those examples I just gave about buying things or watching movies, to me, those feel like things that make really comfortable lives ever so slightly more comfortable. And it seems if we have all of this data at our disposal to help us become more efficient, we should be using it for more than just making sure that when you leave here today, you know exactly where to go to get the lowest price on Ugg boots. <laughs> so I'd like to think about what we could do if we started using data for the social good. What if instead of just asking Yelp for which restaurant you should go to tonight, somebody could ask an app for where they could find clean water? I think knowing this audience, everyone would agree that would be a, a pretty cool world. And I want to talk a little bit more about if we're going to get to that world, who is going to help us shape this data-driven society? Well, we might start off by looking at these guys, the data scientists. Call these guys analysts, statisticians, whatever you call them. These are the people who work with data to build tools so we can all make better decisions about how to live our lives. And what's really cool about these guys is they don't just work on data 9 to 5. No, they do it in their nights and weekends. And increasingly, at things called hackathons. If you've never been to a hackathon, it's a 24-hour event where developers and data scientists get together and just see what cool stuff they can come up with. Now, I'm a data scientist in my day trade, and I was so excited to go to my first hackathon because I, there I was, sitting in this room with these people who have math PhDs, amazing computer science degrees, the most amazing machine learning skills the world has ever seen. I couldn't wait to see what we were going to come up with. It was going to be so powerful. It was going to have so much impact. It was going to be so world-changing. And what we came up with was so unfulfilling. <laughs> There's an app that helps you park your car, another that shows you local deals. I mean... These are great apps, but they're more of the same. And that's because data scientists, left to their own devices, are going to solve their problems. And a 24-year-old is much more interested in where they can park their car than finding low-income housing. OK, so maybe it's not the data scientists that are going to do this. Um, oh, but if we're trying to build a data-driven society, let's look at the institutions that already govern society. Let's turn to the governments. Ah, as Jonathan was telling us earlier this morning, governments have huge amounts of data, and they're starting to open it up. So back in the US, the Obama administration created a site called data.gov. It's a clearinghouse of all the government's data from a huge number of agencies. And that means that for the first time in history, you guys could all go home today and download information from government agencies, everything from earthquakes that happened last week to the consumer price index from last month to the entire US census over last year. That is pretty powerful. Think what we could do with all that social and economic data. So these guys are going to help us bring the data-driven society. All we have to do is get that data. We'll hop over to data.gov, and we'll just start working. In... Oh, wait, data.gov lost its funding? Why is that? Uh, now, I heard some awes. Don't worry. This is from a year ago. Data.gov is fine. But the reason they were on the chopping block in the first place is because for all the excitement around this open data, no one was using it. 
And no one was using it because the government didn't know who was going to use it or how. So they didn't know what formats to open it up in. They didn't know who to get it to. And so all of this data was a lot more like crude oil. It had huge potential. But if you don't know how to refine it, you don't know what you're going to drive with it, it's more or less useless. Shucks, I thought we had something. Okay, maybe it's not the government. Um, oh, okay, got it. We're trying to build a better society. Let's look to the people who are already trying to make society better. The social sector, your nonprofits, your NGOs. These guys are working every day to improve our lives, and not only that, they're flooded with data. If you imagine being a group that brings clean water to people in Africa, you have data about your surveys, you have data about your finances, you have data about well locations. And more than just your own data, you have this data from open governments and third parties opening their data like the World Bank. So we found it. These guys are going to make the data-driven society because they make society better, and now they have the data to do it. So they have all this potential to maximize their impact through data, and no one is looking at it. And understandably, Nonprofits can't always afford a data scientist. They're not traditionally tech companies. So they have all of this data that can increase their impact, and they don't have the skills to look at it. Well, that's a bummer. I'm kind of bummed, guys. We, uh, we found a bunch of people who are using data in their spare time, data wizards, but who don't have connections to the causes. Um, and we have governments who have huge amounts of data, but they don't know who to get it to, and social organizations with great causes, but no skills to look at the data. Wait, I hope you, get, you guys are thinking what I'm thinking, right? We could probably get these guys together, right? What would it look like if we took the skills, combined it with the data and the causes? Well, that's exactly what we were thinking when we founded DataKind, formerly known as Data Without Borders. This is a nonprofit that connects data scientists with social organizations so they can better use data to maximize their impact. Now, these guys work on everything from data collection to analysis and visualization. And one of the ways they work with organizations is that they bring them to these weekend events called data dives. And at a data dive, we invite three social organizations. We have them sit down alongside the data scientists and say, how can we work together to solve some of your data problems? And the hope is that by bridging these two communities, you'll give data scientists a chance to have social impact. You'll give social organizations a chance to maximize their impact. And in the process, we might actually start to get to live in this better world. So let me show you some examples of what this looks like. Uh, one of our events, uh, the New York Civil Liberties Union came and said, we want to understand if the NYPD is using racial discrimination. Awesome question, good social cause. And not only is it an awesome question, there's awesome data behind it. You see, the NYPD releases information about every time they stop and frisk someone. Huge amounts of information, where it happened, when it happened, what the person was wearing, if they had an AK-47, if they liked Justin Bieber, huge amounts of information. <laughs> that last one might not be in there, I have to check. But so it sounds like we're in a pretty good place because we have a great social cause and we have great data behind it. So let's answer that question. So here's the data. So by show of hands, who can tell me if the NYPD is using racial discrimination? Yeah, right? No, me neither. And if you're a social organization, this is probably where you stop. So some of our volunteers said, let's see if we can do something better. And one of the groups came up with this. This is a map of all the stop and frisks in 2010. And what is immediately apparent from this is that you begin to see things. Right? You can see these hot spots up in Spanish Harlem. You can see these hot spots down in downtown Brooklyn. And those are things that I guarantee you would not have been able to observe from that opaque block of numbers that the government provided. And so here's an example where we've taken a cause, we've looked at government data, and brought in the skills to provide a lens into it so that now the NYCLU can go about and examine this. They can start to understand where there are problem areas and start to make the world a little bit better. Another example is the DC Action for Children. These guys are very interested in the welfare of children in DC. And a question they had was how neighborhoods affect the welfare of children. And they had a similar problem where they said, look, we've got all of this data from the government. The government releases lots of information about economic indicators, about social problems uh, at a neighborhood level or by zip code. The trouble is it looks like this. So how do you get an overview of, of how neighborhoods are affecting our children with this kind of thing? So again, they teamed up with some of our volunteers and they came up with this. This is a screenshot of an interactive tool uh, built by a bunch of volunteers, including uh, CC Way, a graphic designer, the Washington Post, who came and gave their time to build this that allows DC Action for Children to roll over this map, see the demographic information, start to draw connections. And this is just you know, step one. Once you start to understand that situation, you can go further, dig into that, deeper, uh, that question deeper, say, how can we actually improve things? But this is that first step to taking that data and making it usable. So you see people with the problem, bringing the data and the skills to understand more. And lastly, the United Nations Global Pulse is an awesome group that is trying to collect all of the world's data so they can literally take a pulse of the world. What is the state of the world right now? 
And they did a global well-being survey where they asked a huge number of mobile users uh, one question. They just said, how are you? How are you feeling? How happy are you in the country that you're in? This was a huge feat for mobile technology. The first time someone was able to just poll the globe about how they feel. But of course, the result of this is lots of data, data that looks like this. And the UN didn't even have answers to the most basic questions about who answered the survey. So again, they worked with volunteers, and they came up with this, a visualization that shows over time who is responding to this survey. And with this, the UN could better understand how their message had been spread. And they found this tool so important that they actually presented these results at the UN General Assembly on a presentation about how we have to think about data if we're going to be doing development. So that's kind of good for a, a weekend's work, not too shabby. Now, if you're sitting in your seats right now and thinking to yourself, I could do that, build a map, you're right, you probably could. These are things that were done by volunteers in just under 24 hours. And I think that goes to show that things like building maps or doing analysis and regressions, those are easy for data scientists, but they're incredibly transformative for social organizations who don't have that capacity. Now, those are all fun, and those are great outputs of the weekend, too, but what's even cooler is that by watching these collaborations, you start to see organizations change. For example, the Grameen Foundation came and wanted to understand some of their cell phone data around a program they run in Africa. And they were so interested in the results from the weekend working together with data scientists that they not only changed their program, they set aside resources to hire a data scientist. So social organizations hiring data skills, that's kind of awesome. That's sort of a transformative change that gets us closer to that data-driven society. Another example is DC Action for Kids. We mentioned them before, and at their event, I remember one of the volunteers being dismayed. He said, oh, I wish we could find parental education data. And they just kind of threw up their hands. We don't have that data. But thankfully, a volunteer next to him worked at the Census Bureau and said, oh, we have that data. Do you want it? Oh, we didn't know it was useful. What format would you like it in? So now you're seeing examples where the government is collaborating. When they know where that goes, more data gets opened up, put to that cause, and put out in a usable way. That's amazing, right? That's a transformative change. And that gets us closer to that data-driven society. Or what we saw happen with GuideStar. GuideStar has all of the financial information about nonprofits in America. And they said, we want to build an early warning system to help us understand if nonprofits are heading to financial failure. And the trouble is, if you look just at their data, it's kind of tough to do. There's not a lot of clear indicators. But they realized there was a site called Great Nonprofits. And Great Nonprofits provides text reviews of nonprofits. Oh, I really love the Red Cross. Oh, I didn't really like UNICEF, things like that. And they said, if we could get access to that data, we might be able to make better inferences about whether these organizations are going to succeed or not. And someone at the event knew Great Nonprofits. They called them up. They said, hey, can, can we have that data? Sure. Go ahead. Use it. Do good things with it. And so here's an example of nonprofits working together, sharing data so they can become more effective. That is a huge change, and that gets us closer to this data-driven society. So I hope that you've seen this as maybe one example of how these organizations can come together, how the collected skills of these groups can start to collaborate so we can start to use data for the social good. And now, that's sort of a, uh, a happy ending to the story. You know, I could probably just stop the talk right now and say, hey, that's, that's one way we can use data for the good. Let's get these groups together. Uh, but I want you to notice one other thing, and something that's subtle, but I think it's very powerful. And that's when I said that these groups are collaborating, I didn't say that the government called Google and UNICEF and, and instituted a project with them. No. I said volunteers, people who spend their time working day to day at Google and Bitly, came together with people from the government and, and social advocates, and they all brought their own specific skills to these problems so that together they could do more than any of them could have done by themselves. And to me, that starts to signal a fundamental shift in the way change happens. You see, right now, we live in a very top-down world. Right? Uh, data is sort of collected by the government. They do studies that collect their data. Uh, tech skills are kind of kept in companies like Google, Silicon Valley, Wall Street. We hear our stories from journalistic institutions, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and we leave social good to those, uh, you know, those other companies like UNICEF and Red Cross, the people you see ads for late at night. Let them do their thing. And a lot of these groups are siloed, right? They don't talk to each other. This is that top-down world where they just live on their own. But I think with these collaborations, we're starting to see the rise of a bottom-up world. And I'm reminded of a quote that I really like. Uh, this is by Anne-Marie Slaughter, the first female head of public policy in the State Department. And she writes, As we've moved from a world of states to a world of governments and social actors, we've come to a networked world. And in that networked world, those entities we used to think of as billiard balls, she's referring to those organizations in the top-down world, 
Those billiard balls are just nodes in a much greater network that forms our society. Now, she's talking about governments and nation states, but I think the same thing applies to this micro level that we're seeing. These things didn't happen through large institutions. They happened through the efforts of you and me. And that means when we ask who is going to help us build this data-driven society, the answer is all of us, all of us working together, communicating our skills, bringing our own special flair to these things. So the question that I want to leave you with is if this is what we can do when we bring these organizations together and these communities, what could we do with your community? What kind of skills could you bring to these problems? Because it's only when all of us are using these skills that only when we are all pitching in that we can take part in these transformative communities. That is when we start to build a data-driven society. That is when we start to change our world. And that is when we start to use data to not just make better decisions about what kind of movies we want to see. That's when we start using data to make better decisions about what kind of a world we want to see. Thank you.